to hear his voice for the first time was really, really cool. I have been looking for you your whole life. I really have. Now I can start filling those pages in with, with, with a beautiful family. It just changes your perspective on why we're doing this. They didn't forget about me. They really remember us. It, it was hard for them. Family. To family. To family. You're watching BYU TV on KBYU DT Provo Salt Lake City. Hello again, Cougar Nation. Welcome back inside the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's, the Burger Boys. For the fourth time in the last five games, BYU has suffered a setback, 21-16 uh, to 16 at Boise State on Saturday, dropping the Cougs to 4-5 and five on the season as they head back out on the road for a big game at UMass this weekend. On today's broadcast, defensive coordinator Eli Satuiaki and offensive coordinator Jeff Grimes joining me. We're with you for the full hour, each coach, each coach with us for 30 minutes. We are coming to you live on BYU TV, BYU Radio, Sirius XM 143 and 107.9 FM, as well as 960 AM ES. SPN 960. We are also live and on demand at BYUTV.org and BYURadio.org plus the BYU TV app and the BYU radio app. You can submit questions for the coaches today with the hashtag CCBYU on Twitter or via comments on BYU Football Facebook Live, where the show is also airing live. And we begin today's show with defensive coordinator and defensive line coach Elisa Tuiaki. And Coach Tuiaki, another tough loss, another close loss. And uh, since you've been here, more than half of BYU's losses have been by seven points or fewer. <laughs> it's grinders. We need, yeah, we need to flip that over and, and say that we're winning by seven, seven points or fewer. I'd rather win. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true, though, uh, that BYU finds itself in this situation more often than not where it's yeah. coming down to the end. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, we, you know, we've all, all been saying it for the last couple of weeks, but just get back into the locker room after the game, just say we're just so close from blowing the top off this thing and being being a dominant team. And, I mean, there's a lot of capability out there, but you got to pay attention to detail and just a little bit, a little bit tighter in all the things that we do. Of course, team game, you win or lose with uh, with uh, contributions from all three phases, but uh, the defense is, I think, playing well right now. Only twice in nine games has BYU allowed more than 23 points in a game, and that's through nine. Uh, if, you're, if you're keeping opponents under 24, you're going to like your chances to win. Washington and USU are the only two games that got away from you. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think uh, for the most part, all year, the kids have been playing well, been playing hard, and um, you know those those two losses back to back. I think one affected the other one too, and you hate to see you lose twice to the same team. I, th I felt like Washington was that, but Utah State's playing really, really well, and they've proven that they're a good team as well. You know, and we're I think they're second nationally in scoring right now. Yeah, I mean they're they're scoring everybody, and um, you know we just we had to do a better job as coaches coming coming off of a loss to UW and prepping them on a short week to a good team, and then we just didn't get that done, but. Um, I think for the most part, week in, week out, the, the boys have been playing hard. They've been, they've been doing a good job. Let's take a look back at the Boise State game for a bit. Uh, rough start, uh, three and out offensively for BYU, and then a short punt, and boom, Boise begins their first drive at your 48-yard line, and then they score. You're down seven zip early. Yeah, that was uh, that was a tough one. You know, we we got put in a bad spot, but um, we had our opportunities to get off the field. You know. And, uh, a third and seven is just a matter of just uh, you know the way that we played our technique and the way that you know we're always going to ask our boys to challenge when we're playing man-to-man -man coverage and and uh, we let one get away and just play the wrong technique but um, you know that ended up going all the way down you know that drive the first drive where we end up giving up a touchdown is really just um, that play that third and seven other than that I thought the I thought the boys did a pretty good job just making them earn it came down to a fourth and one and goal line stand goal line stand they yeah. punched it in and and uh, you know went back and saw it on film and and you know there's a couple of things that you could have done differently but really really applaud their 
their uh, their effort and the fight and just kind of keeping them out uh, until then. One thing about these BYU-Boise games, Boise has to work for what they get. They get these games with BYU. They're coming in usually flying high, pretty high, and BYU finds a way to, to grind it down and, and, and make it uh, and make it tight and make it tough for those guys. They have to really work against you. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, th- I thought that we made them earn everything. Um, you know, they got to – Got a got a couple, you know, a couple of cheap ones or a couple of good cheap ones is what we call it on defense, where we're just giving it and we're not, you know, making not making them earn it. But I thought for the most part all night, um, you know, the boys played hard and and uh, I mean they played hard all the way to the end and gave us an opportunity to win it at the end and and uh, thought that they played well. So BYU did go down seven nothing on that first possession we're talking about. BYU then misses a field goal. Uh, another short field uh, for Boise as a result. They score again 14 nothing in the first, but late in the first quarter, a sequence that I thought flipped the script and looked like it might be decisive in, in your favor, E, and that's uh, after a fumbled kickoff return, Boise gets the ball at your 18 and gets nothing. So instead of maybe being down 21 zip, you're back in the game. Big stand by your guys right that, there. That was huge for us. The sudden change is always is always huge. And talk about it as a coaching staff and try to emphasize it to the players because I think emotionally the swing sometimes can get you out of your game and get you out of uh, play calling a little bit as far as being aggressive. And um, the boys responded, um, you know, forced the field goal and and uh, they showed phenomenal effort, you know, coming after it and almost almost got it and just made them made them kick it uh, kick it wide. And so I thought that was a huge stop for us and good good uh, momentum swing for us defensively. And it wasn't an immediate swing the other way for BYU, but it did end up being 14-6 at halftime. How did you and the guys feel being down eight at the break? Uh, you, you know, we, we felt uh, felt good. Felt like, uh, you know, we were able to address um, exactly what happened as far as going back and looking at the call and just talking about what needed to be improved and, and where we needed to be more stout um, as far as just technique and coverage or or just up front. And, uh, you know, just talking to them at halftime just felt like we, we were in a good spot and just kind of knew, you know, weren't panicking, you know, weren't panicking as far as just giving up those 14, but knew exactly where we were and what we needed to do and, and uh, fixing the mistakes and not overreacting to, to, the, to the points that we ended up giving up. From one week to the next, NI, <clears throat> NIU to, to Boise State, you faced an NIU, uh, a less productive offense, less dynamic, and then you take on Boise. Everyone knows what Boise does. How did your defensive game plan differ from, say, NIU or even the week before that to, to what you had to do against uh, against the Broncos? G- game plans week to week all you know change a lot, sometimes significantly just because NIU was – we were expecting more run. We were expecting a lot of quarterback run and just them to control the ball and, and uh, take calculated shots. With Boise, they're just so wide open with everything they do. I mean, it's, it's dangerous in the run game, dangerous in the pass game, in the boot. I mean, it's just – high flying the ball's coming out there and you feel like you're always kind of giving up completions whether it's short long and even the short ones you feel like they're dumping it off and the guy's running forever and so um completely different offenses yeah. but uh being able to to uh stick to the theme really for us defensively here since we've been here is really um challenge and make people earn it you know you feel feel better about uh somebody catching a fade ball on you when you're really challenging and you're making them earn it and you're saying, hey, that was a good pass and that was a good catch and, and you earned it versus just somebody being completely wide open and you blowing a coverage and then giving up something cheap. And so, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to play that way. We want to challenge people to earn it and, and uh, try to play sound as possible. Defense played Boise well. Uh, second lowest point total allowed, uh, second lowest point total produced by Boise on the season, and their yardage number wasn't what they were used to. Of course, the end result's the end result. 21-16, the Broncos win it, but the BYUD is acquitting itself very well. Uh, most of the season, as we talked about, uh, just two games get away. Other than that, uh, BYU's keeping it, uh, defense keeping them right in it. Offense, I think, especially this next couple of weeks, looking to put points up and uh, go win a game. Uh, how did, uh, well, we'll, talk, we'll take a break. We'll come back, we'll talk about uh, some more Boise uh, uh, components and then I'll look ahead to UMass in the next segment. Heading into break on the coordinator's corner. When we come back, uh, more from defensive coordinator Eli Satuiaki. If you have questions for the coach, we invite you to send them in with hashtag CCBYU on Twitter. Back with more right after this. BYU TV. Don't miss the BYU Santa Clara women's volleyball game. Thursday at 9 Eastern, 7 Mountain. Watch all of your favorite BYU teams on BYU TV, your home for Cougar Sports. Bruh, I ain't got no chill. The BYU TV Sports Post Game. BYU at UMass. Saturday after the game. 
Today at BYU TV, we have all things new. What a better way to start off all this excitement with a little competition. That's right, we're starting with a brand new episode of Just Like Mom and Dad at Six Mountain. But it doesn't stop there. Tomorrow at 8.30 Mountain, Eric Dowdle is going to take you to new places, showing you where history meets innovation in painting the town. Constant new content here on BYU TV. Catch up anytime on BYUtv.org or the BYU TV app. I feel like giving out some compliments. Well, here they are, my favorite customers of the day, and beautiful. You're on a show called Random Action. <laughs> Everybody appreciates you, loves you. You guys are awesome. And take the vehicles up to Park City while there's still light to do the reveal. I can't say enough, that's too cool. This is a, out of control. One, two, three, Random Action! <laughs> Dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody, from burgers to wings, shakes to salads, JCW's quality and a lot of it in Lehigh, American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, coming soon to Harriman. BYU now three quarters of the way through the regular season, nine games down, three games to go. BYU needs to win two of the three, at least two, to get bowl eligible. Next up, UMass, Saturday at Gillette Stadium, home of the New England Patriots, uh, first of consecutive trips. BYU will make back east to play UMass in that stadium. Defensive line coach and defensive coordinator Elisa Tuiaki with us until the bottom of the hour from a three and one a three and one start uh, to losing four or five right now uh, time dwindling to kind of get back on track and no better time than the present but uh, what do you kind of see is uh, maybe characterizing this this stretch right now where you have lost four or five what's maybe not there for you uh, for, of the last last four you know yeah. <laughs> It's, uh, you know, so, sometimes it's just the way the ball bounces and sometimes it's just, uh, you know, the other team plays well and you're not playing as well. And so we, we've just got to find a way to win. Bottom line is these these next three, we've got to find a way to win. Um, and we need to go in believing that we're going to win all of them. Um, I think that we're definitely capable, you know, in all, all three phases we can be clicking. I think we've got a chance to win all three, you know, and, and, and that's definitely going to be the goal for us to go in and, and uh, become bowl eligible number one, but but uh, in-state rivalry, we've got to win this one. Before we leave the Boise game totally behind, uh, BYU did get a couple of takeaways in that game. Uh, Michael Shelton, a pick, and Rhett Sandlin, fumble recovery, right? Uh, BYU does end up, though, minus in the margin, minus one, uh, three giveaways. That's the and that, that, that's the rough thing, is the Cougars are now 2-11 uh, and 11 in the Sitake era when losing the turnover battle, and a lot of teams find themselves with a losing record when minus in the margin, so it's not terribly different that way. But uh, last couple of weeks, it's been that minus one that's kind of been the uh, uh, the, the decisive component. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we've we've got to find find uh, more ways to take away, get some takeaways on defense, and obviously the offense knows, and we all know that we've got to take care of the ball on offense. And you know, one of those one of those was just was uh, quite unfortunate on offense. And I'm sure you'll talk to Grimes when when that uh, comes. But I thought the momentum was really going, and the, the offense is kind of driving up and down the field, but. You know, losing losing that one, um, Matt Bushman obviously um, was hard was hard for us as a whole team. We we're just like, oh shoot, you're gonna one, win and score, yeah. One handed catch, you're gonna go down yep. and score, and we're getting in a great spot. And uh, you know, but you know, defensively, we have to find more ways to to, to take the ball away, and um, you know, we, we've got to be better. Bottom line, we got to be better. Yeah, when it comes to to the havoc plays, um, fumbles recovered, ints, tfls. Have you hit your goals uh, more this season in, in certain games? Where are you on havoc plays right now and disruption? We we haven't we haven't been hitting our goals, you know, and um, I don't think that that uh, adjusting the goals and, and making them fewer is, is is the answer. I think it's it's just uh, the bottom line is we've got to be able to hit those goals, and so we always try to get three takeaways a game, and we're always talking about that and and uh, limit the offensive production as far as big plays to. To seven and a half percent, we want to be be fifteen and fifteen uh, percent. We we haven't been there. We've always been close, um, but uh, when we are hitting our goals, then then you know we're really really lights out defense. But we're not hitting our goals. It's just kind of we're 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 in there. We're giving us, ourselves a chance, but not as disruptive as we can be. And from a definition standpoint, you do look at uh, TFLs, INTs, uh, PBUs, fumble recoveries as as big plays made defensively. How do you characterize again a big play on offense against you yardage wise? Yardage wise, it's uh, ten yards per run 
is a, is a big play, and then 20 yards in the pass is a big play. So tens um, and twenties. Tens and twenties for yep. us, and so if we can if we can limit them to uh, you know underneath that, and we feel we're, we're we're keeping the ball in front of us, we're making them earn it, and we're going to have an opportunity to get a takeaway if we get ourselves in a long, longer situation, second and third down, and. Um, I think that we'll, we'll be playing better defense. When we're doing that, and the and the percentage of big plays against you, you want again is seven and a half. Seven and a half. Seven and a half. Yeah. And so, but really, for us, it's uh, it's doubling the outcome of the offensive big plays. And so, if we can keep them to seven and a half, we can get fifteen, then uh, we would be in a good spot. And you know, if they get ten, but we get twenty, yeah. it's 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 uh, worth. We feel it's probably a little bit too much as far as what we're giving up. And so we do want to keep them down to seven and a half. It's not just doubling their their output. So you look you're looking to double up what they do on your own offense, obviously, when you get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah offensively. Yeah. So uh, Butch Pau uh, did not end up in the stat sheet, I don't think, but I saw him get on the field. Uh, can you update us on where Butch is right now and what's maybe reasonable to expect from him uh, heading down the stretch? Yeah, Butch Butch has done a, done a really really good job. I mean, it's um, you know obviously with his injuries and kind of what he's battling and coming back and. Um, so it's injuries plural we're talking about, you think? With it, him. Injuries plural, yeah. but also, you know, when you come back from an injury, it's, uh, you know, another guy's playing well and, and you're battling back for that spot and then you're kind of finding your, your way as far as, okay, well, you know, uh, uh, this injury's kind of holding me back a little bit more and this kid's playing really well and, and uh, I find myself in, a, in more of a vocal leadership and find myself kind of being there to just keep pushing everybody and, um, he, I, I, I feel like Butch has done a really good job. I mean, he don't, he doesn't sulk. He doesn't sit there and, and uh, he's not sitting there feeling sorry for himself. But he's still vocal in the huddles. He's still really good in practice and trying to jump in there and do as much as he can and just find a way to contribute. Still a captain. Still a captain and yeah. still acting like one. And so you know, really, really appreciate Butch and all he's done. And you know, he's he's uh, he's battling back right now and he will get in and. And, uh, you know, right now with the linebackers that we're playing, I mean, he's, there's there's definitely a role for him, and he'll continue to battle it out, um, you know, as far as getting playing time and getting on the field. But I think that he's doing a good job right now. You know, it, it's, uh, it didn't get a lot of attention, maybe especially the way the game ended, but uh, there was a segment of the game where an important defensive player left the field. Didn't look good, I didn't think, when Chris Wilcox left. That's the starting corner we're talking about now, and Chris Wilcox limped off, didn't put a lot of weight on one of his legs, didn't look good then. How does it look now? Yeah, it doesn't look good right now, you know, and um, you know in these last couple of years we've really taken our lumps with Chris, and yeah. Chris has done a really good job just developing, and Coach Guilford's done a good job developing him. And this year um, you don't really hear much about him, you don't see him much, and it's because he's doing his job. And sometimes, um, you know, corners are kind of forgotten or – you you don't realize how big of a uh, how big of a piece they are in, in your defense when they're out there just kind of quietly doing their job and shutting things down and and he's been like that several weeks but uh, he's done a phenomenal job and and losing him will, will be huge for us and you know we've got obviously another younger Chris Wilcox who got to step up and and we you know take our lumps with with the young kid and continue to develop him but. Um, not having Chris is going to be huge for us because he's a, he's a phenomenal player and done a good job developing. And which one of those young guys will you go with on that corner? Do you think? You know, uh, uh, D'Angelo um, Mandel's done a really good job, mm -hmm. and he's playing already. Yeah. I mean, he's playing already and kind of rotating in. And we've moved moved Mike Shelton around from nickel spot back to corner, just depending on how the other guys are competing. But um, you know, Keenan Ellis is the other one that's got to step up right now and play. And there's definitely a lot of um, capability with both of them. They have a lot of ability to play exactly the way that we play but uh, they're just young you know they're just they don't understand the game as much and there's so many nuances when you're playing playing that position with all the different coverages that um, it's 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 a lot it's a lot to to one mistake or one misalignment uh, you know can cost you a touchdown and so those guys um, as young as they are we've got
whether it's for you or for them. For you or for them. For you or for them. You can find it here. Hey, I'm Dave McCann. Tomorrow on After Further Review, we review Boise and preview UMass. Lane Fowler, David Nixon, and Brian Logan explain the game. Tomorrow night, 7 Eastern, 5 Mountain, here on BYU TV. Bruh, I ain't got no chill. The BYU TV Sports Countdown to Kickoff. BYU at UMass. 11 a.m. Eastern, 9 Mountain, Saturday on BYU TV. My name's Eric LeClaire, and I'm a magician. And what does a magician do? Tricks. Flash, flash. Look. Well, I guess you could say it's... Magic. Turn it from this small to this big. How'd you do that? It's pretty simple. Here's the secret. Instead of a stage, I perform my magic where people least expect it. When you write a sketch, you don't really realize how much goes into it. And they're like, yeah, you're going to have four different shirts because it's just like there's so many things that go into it. You get so dirty and everything like that. We're working on a sketch called Roommate Meeting where we're trying to figure out who's doing all these bad roommate things. OK, that's it. Roommate Meeting. Dalton wrote it, and it's because he is a terrible roommate. Someone has been drinking all of my milk. He's confessing through this sketch that he's a terrible roommate. I wish I knew who it was, you know? You're in the coordinator's corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys, BYU at UMass on Saturday. Four and five Cougars at the four and six minute men. BYU needs two wins to become postseason eligible. UMass needs to win out, which would mean beating BYU in Foxborough, then uh, playing Georgia and beating Georgia in Athens. A tough go for them. Uh, UMass fields a generous defense. Uh, Cougars should be able to score, you'd think, but uh, Coach Tuiaki, UMass can on the other side put up some numbers too. They're top 30 in points per game. Top 30 in yards per play right now. And they have a wide receiver, Andy Isabella, who has more receiving yards than BYU's top seven receivers combined, which is crazy to think about. He had 303 receiving yards in a game this past week. It was triple overtime, mind you. So there was a few more plays to be had there. But in that win over Liberty, he went for 303. It's a lot. It's <laughs> <laughs> a lot. What makes him special? He, he's a really good player. You know, we played against him last year. Um, he scored the only touchdown against us, and it was a, it was a good play. Um, they ended up, th th this team, I'm telling you, it's um, a lot of people, do, you know, they don't give much mind to UMass just because it's so far out there, and we're, we're, you know, we're, we're far over on this side, and you don't really think much about them. All you do is really just look at the record, and you think, well, these guys can't be really good. But um, every year that we've played them, they are the most complex scheme that we play. And uh, really, really difficult uh, defending them offensively. I think that there's a reason why they score points and they're scoring on everybody. It's because, uh, you know, they, they do a good job on offense. And so there's going to be a lot of things that we've got to look out for. And, you know, last year they ended up um, tricking us. They substituted and went in, brought in an extra lineman, um, an 11 personnel, extra lineman with a, t with a tight end, which in my mind I needed to treat like 12 personnel. Mm. And 12 personnel we treat differently from 11, obviously. And we ended up being in a in a scheme that was meant for 11 personnel, and they ended up getting us. And so um, we've got to do a better job. Just, just uh, We've got to do a really good job this, this week. They're, they're good. They, they do a good job with their, their schemes. They're, we've got a lot of good players. And you know, just I've, we've already obviously started watching them on right. offense, and, and I'm just sitting back just kind of like, dang, these dudes are freaking – they're good. These guys are good. They're efficient. They're really good. They do a good job. Their linemen are all big. I mean, it's just another good challenge for us defensively. For our listeners, again, 11 personnel means one running back, one tight end, 12 would be run, one running back, two tight ends, et cetera, et cetera. So you talked about complexity. What's, what makes them a complex scheme uh, in your assessment? You know, most, most teams do something that, that, uh, that poses a challenge for you, whether it's getting out and spreading you in space or, or uh, you know, certain matchups in the way that they align in formation. 
um, certain personnel groups and shifts and motions. They do everything. And um, they don't just do everything on the perimeter. They do everything up front. You can tell that they're well coached up front. You know, we don't really see very many um, tackle overs and and, uh, those types of deals. But these guys do a good job with just unbalanced formations, uh, shifts in motions, you know, fly motions and, you know, ineligibles and eligibles and all that stuff. And so it's just... Um, I think keeping it keeping it simple and keeping it sound for us up front, just kind of keeping the ball in front of us and allowing our D line to really really uh, play up front was going to be the thing. And and we can't overcomplex, especially with Chris Wilcox out and yeah. and just you know our, our our secondary just being a little little young as well. We can't uh, we can't let one just go running down the field, um, you know, unmolested. We got to make sure that we're we keep everything in front of us and challenge everything. And it's going to be a lot when you're talking about. Um, certain coverages to every single thing that they do. It's we, We've got to make sure that we're sound. New quarterback uh, for UMass right now, Andrew Ford, who started seven games, is out uh, for the year. Ross Comas, the new guy, is in. He'd been playing before, but not as the starter. He passed for 540 on Saturday and ran for a couple of scores, too. You know, the the, the Ford player was really good. He yeah. was a good player. and We played him against these last two years and thought that he's really accurate. Um, he couldn't run, though. Um, I think this kid's harder to defend because he can run. And he ends up with, uh, so far this season, 229 rushing yards to the net uh, with five rushing touchdowns, the new starting quarterback, and he had a good day on Saturday against Liberty. Now you say, oh, who's Liberty? Well, they're a new FBS team, but they've got a number of FBS wins too. So Liberty's actually uh, you know, playing pretty well for a new team in the division. You'll see those guys next year, by the way, at your place. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a lot of those teams that, you know, again, when you're out west and, and you don't really think about some of the newer teams that are out there, like um, Old Dominion and some of those other ones, I mean, mm-hmm. those, those teams are all playing really good and, and, uh, you know, we don't really see much as far as just film, but then there are a couple of teams that we end up crossing over with where we, you know, I threw, I threw a game on and was watching Old Dominion, and I was just surprised how good they were. I was like, dude, these guys are good as well. I mean, there's just a lot of good football in the East Coast, and uh, UMass is, is no, no exception to that. Uh, from social media, at Blake underscore Maservi, uh, says the defense seems to have made some good strides the last few games. How much of that improvement is because the teams you're playing and how much of it is schematic and better player execution? I think it's execution, you know. Um, I don't I don't think that there's any really team that we've played, at least defensively. All the offenses that we've faced, there's there's always a challenge, you know, one way and another. Um, but I think that uh, the player execution and I and, uh, think that, uh, that that my staff on the defense is doing a really good job just delivering the message and making sure that we're all sound. And, and I think the players have been playing well. Um, we just got to continue to get them to play well. They got to they got to play with confidence, which sometimes means that we're not doing too much and they're able to go out there and just play without thinking. And, and uh, I think that comes down to it, too, is when you're playing confident because you know what you're doing and you can kind of fly around. And I think we as coaching staff got to make sure that we're not trying to scheme them into position. I think that's one of the, the, the biggest mistakes that you make as a, as a coach now, through the years, as I've seen, is trying to trying to put in a scheme or trying to stop everything with scheme. You know, sometimes players just got to make play. And uh, I think that's that's where we're at right now. Finally, E, uh, BYU, I haven't seen a line, but I but BYU will be favored to win, I would think, on Saturday. But at 4-5, and five, there are no easy assignments, no games you go, we got that one. I mean, right now, this is all about uh, bearing down for 60 and finding a way to get that, that fifth win, which hopefully leads you to six and, and postseason eligibility. Yeah, I think that's the same thing that we were saying last year when they were coming into our place, and they ended up beating us. And, and uh, I mean, there are, there are no, no easy ones. we got to earn it. we got to go out there and take it. And uh, they they won't be giving it up. I mean, they're going to be playing uh, inspired, I'm sure, at home at a at a fun stadium to play at, and we've got to come in and take it. All right, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks. Good luck this weekend. Appreciate it. All right, that's Coach Eli Satuiaki. Coming up after the break, we'll be joined by BYU offensive coordinator Jeff Grimes as we continue on the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. You're on BYU TV, BYU Radio, and ESPN 960. AAA agents like Leticia are popping up where people are having doubts about insurance. Like when it comes time to buy a car. So how can I help you today? What if I decide to become a rideshare driver? If you want to outsmart insurance doubt, visit a AAA branch. No matter what stage you're at in life, you're always looking to take the next step forward. At Deseret First Credit Union, we want to take each and every next step with you. With low auto loan rates, you can be ready to see what's around every new corner. And amazing rates on home mortgages, so you can move up to something you've always dreamed of. Deseret First Credit Union, with you every financial step of the way. 
Membership and eligibility required. Equal housing lender. AAA agents like Octavia are popping up where people are having doubts about insurance. Like here, where Makai is learning to drive. What brings you in today? When I get my car, can my friends drive it as well? If you want to outsmart insurance doubt, visit a AAA branch. I feel like we're home right here. And App Envy. Watch BYU Sports Nation on BYU TV and BYU Radio apps. I didn't think that would go public. Dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody. From burgers to wings, shakes to salads, JCW's quality and a lot of it in Lehigh, American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, coming soon to Harriman. Half hour number two of the Coordinator's Corner. Underway now here at BYU TV and BYU Radio. We welcome in offensive coordinator Jeff Grimes. Your questions for the coach can be sent in on Twitter with the hashtag CCBYU. BYU coming into the week off that 21-16 setback at Boise State. Cougars uh, haven't won a game yet up there on the blue, but uh, four of the five losses are combined eight total points. And all four of those games I'm talking about come down to either a missed field goal or a play from inside the five-yard line to win the game. And Coach Grimes, you haven't been a part of all of them, but uh, BYU Boise games tend up to be uh, tend up uh, end up being uh, oft times bizarre and uh, certainly heartbreaking at the end for BYU. And it was another one of those where you're right there at the end. Uh, how much has that been rolling through your brain the last uh, 36 hours or so? N nothing but that. <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, on one hand, um, at times you can look to the positives in a game like that, but they hurt worse when you when you feel like you were that close and should have won the game, which I feel like, and I don't mean to take this um, the wrong way in terms of Boise, I give them credit. It's a great program. I've coached there. I know most of their coaches and um, have a great respect for what they do, but I really felt like we should have won that game, and and we lost it and didn't didn't execute and made too many mistakes, and so that makes it that that makes it hurt even worse. And as coaches and players, we hurt. I know the fans are frustrated. Um, the former players, the alumni, everybody's frustrated, I'm sure, but um, rest assured no one's more frustrated than I am and our players are. This uh, is something I want to hit before we get to anything else. You told me earlier, months ago, I think it was, that in your coaching career, and granted you were an O-line coach, not a uh, an offensive coordinator, you had spent maybe one half of a game in a booth calling a game. And you were a booth coach this past weekend, were you not? I was, and I was a little bit uncomfortable with it because I don't, um, I don't necessarily like that. I like being down on the field where I can look players in the eye and grab them by the shoulder and give them a hug if they need it or a kick in the pants if they need that. However, with the style um, of offense that, that we decided to play, particularly in this game and the direction I think we're moving, I think it um, – I felt like it would be to our benefit for me to be in the box and be able to see a little bit more and manage the game from up there. So when you get down to that closing sequence, how much of you wanted to be down that elevator and with your guys on the sideline? And how much do you feel, okay, we got this thing, we'll just do it a different way? Yeah, I felt like it, at that moment it was, it, in retrospect, I think it was the right thing for me to be in the box. And, and again, it's not my preference personally, but I think it's the right thing. And I think it just allows me to see the game and, and – um, at times uh, make adjustments during the game a little bit more quickly than I would and then if I were on the sideline. Do you think you'll stay there through the end of the season up top? Um, we'll see how next week goes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Was uh, Ryan kind of your liaison then uh, in terms of getting what you needed to get to? It seemed like in the huddle he could have he was more maybe occupying your position that way a little bit. Was that accurate? or? Well, we had each of the three full-time coaches occupying different p 
pieces of that. Um, Fessy um, had a, had a good piece of it, um, and certainly so did Ryan and and AJ as well. Okay. Uh, but each of those guys kind of divided up what what I would be doing on the sidelines. Okay, um, maybe we can start with the finish uh, for a minute. And for the second straight week, you get the ball with two minutes to play, needing a score for the win. You needed just a field goal against NIU, touchdown against Boise, but you were facing a 73-yard field with this young quarterback. You got 59 yards on that first play of the drive. How much did the Hadley screenplay, which was really well run, change, if at all, what you tried to do in the next few plays? Yeah. Coming big. Yeah, changed it completely. Um, We had assumed it was going to be a mainly pass situation. When you have two minutes and you have to drive the length of the field, you don't want to eat up too much time with with a run, um, and so it's one of those situations where you might mix a run in every now and then. And when that thing went as far as it did right away, I thought, let's go back to our run slash RPO package, which had been the most efficient thing that we had done all day. Our straight drop back pass and our straight run game, um, we were less than 50% efficient. Our runs mixed with RPOs or our runs mixed with um, reads by the quarterback, we were much more efficient, about 65% on the day. And so I went to that right away, feeling like we'd have the opportunity to either get a run or a quick throw, and and we did um, initially. And then we just we weren't able to get the yards that we needed once we got it down there close. A couple of plays to, to look at uh, on, on Lopini's uh, sweep from far hash to near. Uh, I don't know if you thought it could have been blocked a little better on the wide side. Uh, your thoughts on that one? Yeah, we, we missed the linebacker. Uh, if, if we had, and they stunted on the play, so it picked one of our linemen off. But if we had gotten through clean to the linebacker, then I think he would have been in position. To go one on one with a safety just shy of the goal line. That would have been line. James's guy, right? I think was mm-hmm. it not? Yeah, yeah. Um, but e- even having said that, I felt like we were in position to, uh, with that much green grass, turn I- a corner. I thought, yeah, I thought Maybe. he might have been able to do that and, and get in, but uh, nonetheless, we weren't we weren't able to. But it it certainly gained us enough yardage to feel like we were in good position. This the final play doesn't happen without Zach making a nice play on the fourth and two. Uh, from the five, I think it was. Uh, it's quarterback draw. When 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 you go empty there, I'm almost conditioned to think quarterback draw. And it was a, and and get that hole, that first hole. He sees somebody immediately kind of close. He has to make a nice evasive move to take it off to the left and make sure he gets those yards to to, to get to the marker. Well, really, that play as well as the first touchdown that Zach scored um, is a play where we have multiple options. It's a it's a it's a run that has RPOs with it. So he had the option to run it. We also had a route concept to the field and a route concept to the boundary, and he could have he could have thrown the football there. And it's really based on what he sees once uh, both pre-snap and then how the defense reacts once the ball is snapped. And I think I think that was one of those plays that could have probably gone either way. You could make mm-hmm. a case for him having thrown the football to one of the slants, but you could also make a case for him running it. The execution of the run wasn't wasn't blocked quite as cleanly as it could have been, but it did get us the first down. And once you end up uh, with that seven-second situation, maybe we'll just go to uh, – we'll take it from uh, at Aussie Dan 9418. Was Zach specifically told during the timeout with seven seconds left to throw the ball so that two plays could incur, occur instead of one? Yeah, we always give the quarterback the instruction on what the situation is there. And, you know, he's a young guy that, that um, I think certainly gave us a chance to win that game. Um However, he makes some mistakes sometimes too, and he wishes he could have had that one back. It was the first thing he said to me after the game. Um, but certainly we had uh, the intentions there of a quick throw or throw away and then another play in mind. We already had the next play in mind, as a matter of fact. So seven seconds is a two-play situation for you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the play design, uh, as in terms of what it was – drawn up to do and what ended up happening was it really just a matter of quarterback decision at that point did you like the design um i like the design and i go i went back and looked at it we talked about it as a staff this morning i think it was the right call there was poor protection we missed a block um however the ball should have been gone by then um it was a really quick throw and um and he should have let the ball go and and just didn't didn't again he's a guy Zach's that guy that's been the guy that that you love if he's a basketball player and he makes that last second shot uh, freelancing a little bit. Um, But he's also that guy sometimes that you might be frustrated with um, because he didn't follow the the design as well as as he could have. But again, I, I don't attribute that to him 
um, in any way being being stubborn or uncoachable. He's just young, and he's still learning how to play the game within limits. And what you love about him is he's that guy that wants to take the last second shot. He needs to learn what the limits are to what he can do and and what other players can do if he'll if he'll just play within the offense. On that play, when you say it's a quick throw, we're talking Shumway slant, right? Aren't we on that one? Yeah, he had two yeah. options. He had him or he had Dylan. Dylan on the left. Uh, mm-hmm. So if it's not there, chuck it away, get another one, and see what you do on the final play. That would have been the hope, right? Absolutely. Okay. Break time on the coordinator's corner. When we come back, we'll have more with offense coordinator Jeff Grimes. Stay with us. When my grandfather started this company in 1947, he couldn't have envisioned what we would ultimately become. We realized that our value to our customers is that we will be there day after day, year after year, doing whatever we need to to find solutions to the challenges that they face. We are committed to be honestly better in all that we do, in every opportunity that we have to serve our customers. On BYU Football with Kalani Sitake, the coach recaps the Boise State game, previews the matchup with UMass, and answers your questions using the hashtag Sitake Show. Watch BYU Football with Kalani Sitake tomorrow at 8 Eastern on BYU TV. Blue runs deep on BYU TV. Don't miss the BYU Santa Clara women's volleyball game. Thursday at 9 Eastern, 7 Mountain. Watch all of your favorite BYU teams on BYU TV, your home for Cougar sports. Next time on the Story Trek reunion episode, I'm back in the Palmetto State. <laughs> Years ago, I met the happiest lady in town with a heart-wrenching story. The hardest thing I ever faced and hope I never have to face it again. But what happens when she loses the love of her life? I don't know where I'm going to stay tonight. I don't. How a talented musician ended up living on the streets. Join me from South Carolina tomorrow on the Story Trek. Coordinator's Corner brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. BYU offense coordinator Jeff Grimes with me until the top of the hour. This week, 4-5 and five, BYU visiting 4-6 and six, UMass. Cougs coming off that uh, 21-16 heartbreaker in Boise. Minutemen were triple overtime winners, 62-59 over Liberty this past weekend. This weekend's game, by the way, uh, produced by 11 sports back east, but will air live on BYU TV and the BYU TV apps. You can also, of course, catch the game on uh, BYU Radio, so full BYU TV and radio coverage this weekend from uh, back east. Well, uh, Coach uh, Grimes, uh, the Boise game uh, didn't begin great. You're down 14 nothing early. They had a short field to go up 21 zip, but that did not happen. The BYU defense really held well, and they've been playing well to keep BYU in games. And so halftime, 14-6, you're thinking we're right where we need to be, right? Absolutely. Our defense played great the last couple of weeks and, and given us great confidence that if we can just we can just score some, then, then we'll have the opportunity to win the game. Um, so, yeah, at halftime, we just felt like we needed to execute a little bit better. Um, certainly our, our pass protection needed to get better and, and, um, and needed to just get in a little bit more rhythm. And I felt like we did get in rhythm a little bit, little bit better there in the second half, but, again, just didn't, didn't capitalize in the red zone. There's a question from social media that I'll ask, and then I'll follow it up with uh, some, uh, some post-amble, if you will. The question's simple. How can we improve performance in the red zone? Now, having asked that two weeks ago when we last talked, the, the conversation we had was about how well red zone performance had been going, and it's true. Through seven games, if you take away the, the kneel-down red zone possessions, BYU had scored touchdowns on 18 of 23 non-kneel-down red zone possessions. That's an excellent 78.3% red zone touchdown rate. It's just the back-to-back games that we just had, NIU and BSU, where things have gone the other way. You've had one touchdown on seven red zone drives, not including uh, the Bushman fumble that comes at the three-yard line. So it really has been a recent phenomenon because it had been a strength before the last two weeks. Yeah, it has. And, you know, I think there are a number of things if you look at 
some of the things that have happened with our offense in the last three weeks, some of it good, some of it not so good, you're looking at a couple of things. Obviously, a change in quarterback and a change in, in offensive style. And that's not just due to the quarterback. And As we talked about three weeks ago, um, part of the reason that we had a change in quarterback is that we had changed some of our offensive personnel, having lost some of our tight ends, particularly those guys who were – uh, th- our best three blocking tight ends we'd lost from from uh, the summer um, through um, the Washington game mm-hmm. and put ourselves in position where we felt like we needed a little bit different approach in in terms of personnel and what we were doing with the personnel and then the change at quarterback obviously um, Zach has a different skill set than Tanner and I think overall our offense ha- has evolved and so as a coach you can take one of two approaches. You can be stubborn and say, no, this is my offense and this is what we installed and this is what we we're going to do. Or you can try to fit an offense best to your personnel and put the guys in position where they can do what they do best. I think especially when you're dealing with young players, you have to do that. As we develop them, some of them can become different types of players maybe down the road. Zach will be something different in a year or two than what he is now, as will Dallin Holker, as will Keanu and and so many other guys that we're playing with right now, those guys will be capable of more and different things. Um, but having gone through the change that we have philosophically the last few weeks, I think we're just going through some of those growing pains. And and part of that is our red zone offense, and, and part of it's been the protection, um, and, and part of it's been not being efficient enough in the run game. Did you foresee – philosophy scheme change was it was it a consideration in the january through august time when you when you built this thing well we tried to build an offense that was versatile enough that we could go in different directions and so when we've done this we haven't had to invent any terminology all these things that we're doing now are things that are in the playbook we just really haven't spent much time doing them and some of them are things that are new that we really hadn't introduced because we didn't know we'd we'd be end up we would end up going this direction um so it's stuff that was there, just stuff that we hadn't spent much time working on. How much has been? Uh, how much of the coaches had to get up to speed as much as the players on on scheme change, if you will? Like, how much of a course correction has it really been? Not a whole lot. We've got experienced coaches in our in our room, and and all of the things that we're doing are are things that that everybody's done to some extent before at other places. So, um, it, it's more just teaching the players how to handle what we're asking them to do. In terms of resiliency, how would you kind of rate your guys right now in terms of hanging in and, uh, and again being that group? Because you mentioned that word a lot in terms about being able to withstand adversity. I think we've actually grown in that regard, and even though we've come up short, I think you see an offense that is continuing to play all the way to the end of the game. And I think there have been times where um, the personality of our offense has looked a little bit dejected when we got down early, and I don't see that as much anymore. I see a group of guys that is remaining positive and continues to play regardless of the situation. So I think sometimes um, those trials and the hard moments that we've been through, we've, we've learned from and we've grown a little bit mentally tougher. Okay, uh, heading to break on the Coordinator's Corner. When we come back, your social media questions, more of them for Coach Jeff Grimes using hashtag CCBYU as we continue live on BYU TV, BYU Radio, and ESPN 960. We're back after this. This is where we dominate. Our playground, place of business. This is our promised land where we seek to find ourselves and we're here to make sure the spaces our best prove themselves on appear how they should. Intermountain Healthcare, official medical provider for BYU Athletics.
you write a sketch, you don't really realize how much goes into it. And they were like, yeah, you're gonna have four different shirts because it's just like, there's so many things that go into it. It gets so dirty and everything like that. We're working on a sketch called Roommate Meeting where we're trying to figure out who's doing all these bad roommate things. Okay, that's it, Roommate Meeting. Dalton wrote it and it's because he is a terrible roommate. Someone has been drinking all of my milk. He's confessing through this sketch that he's a terrible roommate. <sighs> It's a very revealing prank on this student council. <gasps> and I got this basketball team all fouled up. All the humanity. Words can't describe what happened. It was a photo shoot for a charity calendar that they put together. Hold on, is that Colin? I don't know. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, the guy's that. <laughs> Dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody, from burgers to wings, shakes to salads. JCW's quality and a lot of it in Lehigh, American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, and coming soon to Harriman. BYU Offensive Coordinator Jeff Grimes with us in our final segment of today's show. BYU at Gillette Stadium taking on UMass this Saturday. And again, you can see the game on BYU TV. It's produced by 11 Sports back east, but will air locally on BYU TV. And so you can watch it along with listening to it on BYU Radio. Full comprehensive coverage on BYU TV and BYU Radio. It's an early one. Uh, on radio, it's an 8 a.m. pregame, TV 9 a.m. pregame, and then uh, the kick at 10 a.m. Mountain Time this weekend. Uh, before I throw Boise State in the total review and, and look ahead uh, to UMass, Coach Grimes, once once you and the players have all kind of uh, uh, decompressed and, and settled with it, what's the overriding uh, maybe impression you're left with as you move forward having learned from it and, and again, trying to put it behind you? There's uh, any time you're in this situation as a coach, I think you can choose to respond in one of two ways, and it is a choice. You can be really angry and frustrated and, and blame the players, or you can take a positive approach and say that here are the corrections that need to be made, and the good news is that we can make those corrections, and that's the approach that we're taking because we have good kids, and they want to play well. And again, I know, I know fans are frustrated, and I understand that uh, frustration, but we have a great group of kids, and these guys are, are, are willing to give us everything that they've got. We've got to do a better job of coaching these young guys, developing them, and, and the overall message is we're not that far away. And that's very true, and there's a lot of ways to indicate that you're not that far away. And to that note, um, is it okay, you know, when I say uh, you can get bowl eligible, you can win a bowl game, you can finish with a winning record, these are positive things after a 4-9 and nine season on which you can build knowing so many of these guys are young, freshmen, who are just getting their first experience. So to, to say the future's bright isn't a Pollyanna approach, I don't think. I think it's based in reality. How do you view it? There's no question that's the case, and we're growing. Um, but in having chosen to play so many young players, because those are, are the best guys for the job right now, there, there are definitely um, some setbacks and some bumps along the road, but the future is definitely bright, and, and we're definitely excited about the direction that we're headed. And, and finishing strong with these next four games, that including a bowl game, um, is something that I think will give us a real springboard into into this offseason and next fall. Okay, beyond big picture, it's about 60 minutes against UMass. We know that. Uh, UMass is allowing 41.4 points a game. That's 126th in the FBS. 6.56 yards per play. That's 119th in the FBS. BYU, by comparison, scored 49 against Hawaii, which ranks 115th and 112th. So in that same neighborhood, but UMass a little more porous as it turns out. It's reasonable to expect, then, that the BYU offense should get loose and score some this weekend. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> but one thing I've learned over the years, uh, having done this for 25 years now, um, every Saturday is different with college players. and No givens. No, there are no givens. There are no, there are no ways that you can anticipate what's going to happen based on what a team has done prior to that point. I mean, uh, you, you, you look at uh, just from week to week, I can name countless examples that, I, that I've seen over the years of a team that, that beats someone uh, that's a really good team one week, and then they lose to a team that's, that's typically seen as not 
near the talent the following week. And sometimes a defense um, doesn't play well one week and then they make an adjustment and they come out and play well the next. The thing that this defense does that'll that'll pose a, a challenge for us, they play a lot of man coverage and they're not afraid to put you in position where they're gonna dare you to win the game throwing the football and, and they make it a challenge on you in the run game and they're one of those teams that kind of stuffs you for a while and then ha- has tended to give up a big play. And so um, it's not necessarily one of those things where you just look at the tape and you look at the numbers and you see that those things necessarily add up. Yeah, relative to the uh, transitive properties game, which who beats who beats who is uh, quite a hoot in college football every year. Uh, right. Question from uh, social media at uh, Drew Weidman asks, what happened to fly sweep? It seems that BYU hasn't run that play as much lately. It was very effective at the start of the season and made teams honor the run, which opened up the passing game for BYU. Where is the, the BYU right now relative to, to that particular component of your offense? Yeah, it's still definitely a part of, of our offense. But if you look at what we were – and we ran a few on Saturday. Um, but if you look at um, the direction that we've gone, it, it leans a little bit more to um, Zach's skill set, which um, – emphasizes some other things in the run game, and that would be his ability to run rather than a jet or a handoff to a back and his ability to run or throw on the same play. Okay. We uh, mentioned earlier, I mentioned earlier, uh, foresight relative to scheme change, philosophy change. Could you have foreseen Zach coming in at roughly this part of the season when he did come in, and how's he responded in uh, three starts to you, uh, being the youngest starting quarterback in BYU football history, by the way? Yeah, some some great moments and some some really down moments as well. And and again, that's what's what you often expect with a young guy. And I think if he, I think he's learning each week what his limitations are. And there's a learning curve for a young quarterback who has the ability to scramble around and make plays. And he's got what he's got to learn is when it's time to do that and when it's not. And um, it's harder to get away from these guys in college football than it was at Corner Canyon. <laughs> a little bit. That said, uh, there's no reason to not believe that Zach Wilson will be uh, a special talent here at BYU. Is that overstating things? Um, no, not at all. He, I think he is a special talent, um, but he's still largely unproven. He's only played in three games, and as I said, he's shown great moments. He's shown flashes of brilliance, but he's also shown at times that he makes mistakes just like just like our young left tackle does and our young tight end and our young receiver. And so it, it's just more noticeable because he has the ball in his hand every play. And so I know, I, I'm sure, I don't, I don't read the social media stuff or any of the reports or any of that. I just don't have time for it. But I'm sure um, the report on him right now is different than it was against Hawaii after that game. But he's the same guy. Uh, 30 seconds maybe on third downs for you guys on offense right now. Where are you on that? Um, still a work in progress, obviously. Uh, but I do think some of the things that we're doing um, as we learn how to play uh, with this tempo a little bit better will help us. All right. Uh, UMass at Gillette Stadium, NFL Stadium. It'll be fun for the guys to get into that environment on the weekend, we think. Yeah, I hope so. And um, I've never been there, so I'm looking forward to it. And should be a good game. It's an early one. Again, uh, 10 o'clock here for the kick in the mountain time zone. Uh, noon back east as the Cougars play in what we hope is the sunshine. I've done a little bit of looking ahead. Forecasts might have some precipitation. We'll see how it trans. But again, no givens. No one knows. Not even the weather. That'll do it for the Coordinator's Corner. We're back next week with Coach Grimes and Special Teams Coordinator Ed Lamb as we review the BYU-UMass game and look ahead to the Cougars' home finale with New Mexico State. Thanks for today to producer Jason Shepard, Michael Miner, and the entire crew from BYU TV and from BYU Radio, Sean O'Neill, Terry South, Sean Fate, intern Lindsey Peterson, and GM Don Chaline. I'm Greg Rubel. For the coaches, Tuiaki and Grimes, this has been the Coordinator's Corner. We'll talk to you next week at 1 Eastern, 11 a.m. Mountain Time. So long. It was obvious to me that there were a significant number of kids who were never going to make it in yet another foster home. We ended up creating a school where they could live with the same group of kids, get job skills, and a competent education. Young kids that have had a lot of problems, a lot of issues to deal with, feel like they have a home. San Pasquale Academy is truly changing lives. Blue runs deep on BYU.